In 1952, Florence Chadwick stepped into the chilly waters of Catalina Island with a goal of swimming all the way from Catalina to the California coastline, 26 miles. Now, she had swam the English Channel both ways already at this point, but this was different. And as she stepped into the waters there at Catalina, it was a cold and foggy day. Couldn't even see hardly 10 feet ahead of you. The boats that accompanied her um, could barely be, be seen unless they came alongside of her. 15 hours into her swim. Yeah, you heard me right. 15 hours into her swim. She didn't think she could go on. Her mother was in one of the boats, and so she came up close to Florence and said, come on, you can do it. You're almost there. I believe in you. Come on, you could do it. And yet physically, she was exhausted. Emotionally, she was depleted. And 15 hours into this swim, she gave up. She, she just gave up. Once she was in the boat, even though the fog was so thick, they realized she was, it was just right there. She was right there. But she gave up too soon. The next day at a news conference, this is what she said. She said, all I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. But she couldn't see the shore. All she could see was the fog. Have you ever been in one of those moments where all you can see is just right what's in front of you? You, you can't find hope because of what you're facing. You, you can't seem to find peace because of what's right before your eyes. You, you're, you're struggling to make sense of anything. Maybe it's a relationship that the, the pain, the, the anxiety, the, the, the battle, the conflict is so strong you can't see to the other side anymore. Maybe it's just 2020. You could just say 2020. That's the fog. The whole year. What part of it? All of it. All of the year. Like, is this pandemic ever going to end? It's just like a fog that has settled in and it just keeps going and going and going and going and we, we don't know is there an end to this or when is there an end to this. So here we are entering into the Christmas season with a brand new series. And, and some of you are here on our campus, I'm so thankful for you. And some of you are online, and I'm so thankful for you. And, and wherever you're at, I, I want you to think through, like, what are you looking at? What are you focused at? What are you, what are you seeing in this season? And remember this. The birth of Jesus is like the dawning of a new day. It's like watching the inauguration of a new kingdom and a glimpse now, of things that are going to be fulfilled. We're introduced in the coming of Jesus to a, a new vision of the kingdom of heaven in a new way through Jesus. And even though there's so much more that will be fulfilled yet in the future, there are things that God is doing here in the story of the birth of Jesus and here in our midst today. That help us know, help us understand, help us trust God is at work and we get to participate. He has a plan and purpose for your life, for, for my life. And we get glimpses of grace. We see shadows of hope. We see partially, like through a fog, things that one day will be fulfilled. And we get glimpses of those in the Christmas story, but we also can see them right here, right now, if we're looking and we've got to cultivate minds and sight and imagination that look for and look to participate in what God is doing all around us. Our day, our time needs messengers, needs reminders. God is still up to good. Amen? He's still at work. We need participants, not spectators. God's looking for followers, not fans. People who will get in the game, not just be the armchair quarterbacks sitting on their couches, eating their Cheetos, making all kinds of opinion statements, and not doing anything. We're invited to participate in God's work right here, right now. If you have your Bibles, 
If you have a smartphone, grab them. Turn to Matthew chapter one, if you will. I want, to see, I want you to see this passage with your own eyes. And we're going to launch into this Christmas season with, with this new series, Here Comes Heaven, straight here in Matthew 1. Uh, the very first chapter of the New Testament launches us into this story of Jesus and the new things that God is up to. I'll start reading in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce, to divorce her quietly. See, uh, life just threw Joseph a curveball and he wasn't sure what to do with it. Yet his character rose to the surface. But, but in this moment, we've got to understand what's, what's going on in Joseph and around Joseph so we can understand the reality of this good news that uh, comes in the form of Jesus. I, I was actually Googling s things sort of like, um, what was the, the culture, what was the climate um, during the birth of Jesus? What was the culture like? What was the world like? And I found an article in the LA Times from December 24th of 1994, and it was just entitled, uh, The Tale of Jesus' Birth, um, and how it provides a look at the social climate of the times. Look at the fog that Joseph and others were facing in a season like this. The atmosphere of, of that area was one of upheaval, of, of, of social discontent, of political chaos under Herod and Caesar. It was a third world context under a military dictatorship under Roman Empire occupation. Injustice was built into the system. The top 10% were in control, meaning rich and poor had strife against one another constantly. There was a tax burden that was out of control, gender separation, racial disparity. Words that were used to describe that time were oppressive and unstable. Even religiously, nothing was going on. If you understand your Bible from the close of the Old Testament to the uh, first chapter and announcement of the angels in the New Testament, there were some 400 years of silence. 400 years where it didn't seem like God was even moving. Prophets weren't prophesying. Revivals weren't happening. There was a, a silence and there was a fog that had settled all over even the people of God. And now, on top of all of this, it seems to be, it, from all appearances, it seems to be now Joseph's fiance is pregnant out of wedlock. There is a fog settling around Joseph and no matter how good and godly of a man he was, there was a struggle. So he had in mind, in the midst of the fog, to divorce his wife quietly, but he didn't know what else to do. Look at verse 20. But after he had considered this, now pause right there. There's a word in the original Greek language that would go there. It's not in our NIV translation. It's this word idu in the Greek. It means behold or it means look. But, but if you're reading it, it would be something more like this. But after he had considered this, behold, like it's an attention grabber. Behold. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. See, this is the long-awaited Messiah. This is the fulfillment of promises that had been given thousands of years before. Look at verse 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. That's way back in Isaiah chapter 7, hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah prophesied this. Verse 23, and it starts with a word that's not there, so let me just say it. Behold, it's in the Greek, behold, behold. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. The angel announces 
behold. And, and it means look. And it's really a command. It's in the imperative, but it's an invitation. Look, what will you see in a different way? What will you understand what's going on, Joseph, or all of you who are in a fog? All of you who are, who are trying to find your way through hopelessness or despair or depression or uncertainty or instability. You're, you're looking, behold, here's the good news. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right here. Right now. There's, a, there's an invitation to a new vision to see in a different way, to have your perspective and my perspective changed, transformed, because God is with us. This is what scholars call the incarnation. This is, this is what theologically we refer to as the, the incarnation. God takes on human nature. God in the person of Jesus becomes flesh and blood. A, a man and he, he's born and he lives and he eats and he walks this earth and he, and he teaches. And years and years ago, I, I read this book and I was reminded about it, it this week, um, The Forgotten Ways by Alan Hirsch. And, and he talks in this book about four dimensions of the incarnation. There, there's four dimensions that give us clarity and insight. To what does this mean? And, and this is what Hirsch talks about. The four dimensions of the incarnation are presence, proximity, powerlessness, and proclamation. Presence, proximity, powerlessness, and proclamation. Now, let me just break those down real quick. Number one, presence. In, in Jesus, the, the incarnation of Jesus, in Jesus, the eternal God, I love this, is fully present to us. God in the flesh. He's fully present. He's paying attention. He's with us. He moves into our neighborhood. Fully present. John chapter 1, verse 14. John writes it this way. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have, what's the word? Seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. We have seen his glory because he moved in. He came near. Listen to this. God's response to pain and turmoil in the world. It wasn't just simply to give answers. It wasn't just simply, here's a few steps. If you'll take these steps. God's response to pain and turmoil was to send his son to be with us. And we can start to see God in Jesus. We get a glimpse of the Father in Jesus, bringing heaven to earth. Heaven is more than just a place. Heaven is his presence with us. And I hope that you would see today, Emmanuel, God with us. That's his presence. Second, proximity. God in Christ approached us not only in a way that we could understand, but get this, in a way we can access. In a way we can access. We have access. He's available. And, and not only did Jesus call people to repentance and proclaim the presence of God, but he also became friends with people, even outcasts. He lived in proximity with the broken and the lost. That's why he was called a friend of sinners and tax collectors. The way that he treated children, the way that he interacted with women, the attention that he gave to those who were disabled, the, the way that he brought hope to outcasts was revolutionary. He lived in proximity, close proximity to those who desperately needed hope. Luke 19 verse 10 Jesus says, for the Son of Man came to seek by seeing, seek and save the lost. Not the people who said, I'm healthy, I'm clean, I'm good, I've got it together. The people who said, I need help, I'm desperate for hope, the, the fog is settling in. Jesus in the incarnation came near, made himself available so we can have access to the Father. He also came third in powerlessness. In becoming one of us, God takes the form of a servant. Not that of someone who rules over us, but someone who walks alongside of us. He pushes away all of those displays of coercive power and demonstrates how love 
and humility reflect the true nature of who God is. And they are the key means to transform us and our society. Powerlessness, humility. Just, just think about the way that Jesus was born. The angel announces to Joseph, who is Joseph? The truth is he's a nobody from nowhere, just an ordinary guy. Who is Mary, a, a young virgin? She wasn't someone super spiritual. She was ordinary, normal person. They're, they're, they're poor. And God comes to reveal himself to them in the most humble of circumstances. And that's why Paul would write in Philippians something that we believe was a hymn saying by the early church, Philippians chapter two. And then Paul also applies it to us. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, or instead, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is how Jesus came in powerlessness. See, if, if we're to come on the scene and we're the Messiah, chances are we're like, I'm here, look at me. And all of our fans would be like, we're so glad you're here. Now it's time to win. And Jesus says, yes, I'm, I'm gonna win, but I'm gonna win by laying down my life. And sacrificing myself and serving others. He identified with the weak and he won his victory. He won our victory, not through strength, but through weakness. That's why he can say to us in our weakness. And we can say, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because God's grace is sufficient for us. So presence, proximity, powerlessness, and proclamation. Not only did, did Jesus come in all of these ways, but he also came to proclaim. He heralded the reign of God. He called people to respond in repentance and faith. He initiates this gospel invitation, which is still active to, the, to this very day. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. Anyone who turns from their ways, turns from their sins, and turns to Christ can experience his salvation. Jesus in Mark chapter one, these, these are like the very earliest verses in the book of Mark, and the very earliest verses about Jesus in verse 15. Here's what Jesus says, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus had a message to share. It was a message of good news in a world filled with bad news. It was a message of hope and peace and joy and love. It was a message that God is near and his work is all around and Jesus inaugurated this new kingdom and invites us to be involved. Jesus came with his presence, with proximity, powerlessness, and with proclamation. So let's pause there for just a moment. That's, that's the work Jesus has done. What does it mean for us? And why are we doing a series like this? And I believe in many ways we are in an in-between time where we can look back and we can read the truth of, of how this kingdom started, but then we could also, if we have biblical imagination, we can look forward and we can see how this kingdom is fulfilled. But if we're not careful, we let the fog settle in around us and we lose sight of that hope. Somebody asked me a, a few months ago, don't you think we're living in the end times? Don't you think we're living in the last days? I sort of paused for a moment. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely do. I, I think we're living in the end times. And this is why I just hold them. But here's what you have to know. Even the earliest disciples of Jesus 2,000 years ago thought they were living in the end times. And we're both right. The end times can just last for a long time. You know what I mean? Absolutely, we're living in those days. And if you know your scripture, if you've been around church for a long time, we, we live in this time where the first coming of Jesus, we're reading about this, this is sort of the advent the, or the Christmas story, the birth of Jesus. 
is a massive part of our faith. But also the second coming of Jesus is a massive part of our faith. And just as assuredly as Jesus has come once to this earth as a baby in in human form, Jesus is coming again. But this time when he comes, he's coming to fulfill and inaugurate his final kingdom that has ultimate fulfillment of peace and love and joy and justice and all of these things. And we live in this in-between time. We live right now where we're getting glimpses of Jesus, but there's coming a time. Revelation 21 speaks of it like this. Right now, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and there's faith that we need, not sight. Uh, But there's coming a day, Revelation 21, John writes, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, that's our word, behold. Behold, look, see this. God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. We just say with them, with me, with them. And be their God. See, that's what we're talking about. Emmanuel, God with us in the form of Jesus is a glimpse, is a hint of something that will be ultimately fulfilled here in Revelation 21. He will dwell with us. Our faith will be made sight in this moment fully. Revelation 22 verse 3 says, no longer that there will be any curse The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. I love just this first part of verse 4. And they will see his face. They will see his face. That's that element of being with somebody where you're so close, you're you're sort of eye to eye, you're you're face to face. And, and, And this is written in the Greek, but I remember back in seminary, way back in seminary, which is amazing because I don't remember much of anything from way back in seminary. But I do remember this when I was in Hebrew uh, class, and, and they taught us this phrase, panim el panim. And, and for whatever reason, it just jumped out at me, and it stuck with me for all these years, because it simply means face to face. We will see God. He will see us. Everything will be right. Everything will be restored. But until that time, What are we to do when it feels like the fog is so thick we can't see through, when it feels like the pain is ripping our hearts apart, where it feels like the fear or the anxiety or the uncertainty or the isolation is more than we can bear, what are we to do? We start with the incarnation of Jesus, understanding God so loves the world this much. He sends his son. Uh, understanding that, that when we were desperate and in need of rescue, God didn't say, do these things and get right and then come to me. Instead, God says, I'll send my son for you. The incarnation also invites us that there's a purpose, but we've got to see. We've got to have a new perspective to understand I'll just quickly say, and I don't know if you'd say this too, but 2020 has been one of the most difficult years of my life. I went back through my calendar. I went back through some some things, and I was just looking at some of the things that have happened, some of the conversations I've been in, some of the decisions we've had to to, to make, some of the uncertainty and anxiety. This has been a really hard year. We've even had, I thought about this yesterday, We've even had three surgeries uh, for our children in the midst of this crisis. I forgot about those because all the other stuff is so clamoring for my attention, trying to distract me. It's been a very difficult year. 10 or 11 months ago, I, I thought something was happening to my sight. I thought, I, I, I don't know that I am seeing that well. So I, I went to the doctor and, and the doctor basically gave me an eye exam and said, you're, you're doing pretty good. And I'm like, I'm not doing pretty good. He's like, well, for your age, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? And so he said, you need these readers. And I can't hardly read anything without these readers now. And now I'm realizing I need to go back to the doctor because I think 
Zoom has destroyed my eyesight even more. But before I went to the doctor, I realized you could do this cool thing now. You can go online and you can order glasses and try them on at home before you even get them. And you don't even have to go to the doctor necessarily. So I thought maybe you could just help me with my glasses. What do you think? I don't know. Do you like these? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you're just being kind. You don't, you don't have to clap and vote. What about these? Like, like these? You're like, they look just like the other ones. No, they don't. Look at how different those are. That's radically different. And, and as I was walking around my house and showing the kids, they're, they're like, why are you squinting? I'm like, cause I can't see. They're like, why can't you see? You've got glasses on. I'm like, no, 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 you're just looking at the frame. The frame has changed, but the lens is worthless because it's the same. Th th these are just, they're, they're just for looks. Like superficial looks not to help me see better. And I can't say I'm in the midst of a fog. I can't see clearly. And so I'm just going to put on these fake glasses to try to see a little bit more clearly and make sense through the midst of this fog because they don't work. They're just for looks. And I'm afraid some of our faith is being evidenced to be a little more superficial than we wanted it to be. I can't close this box to save my life. I'm afraid some of our faith, some of our vision, some of our trust is, is being exposed in this season. It's not sufficient. I'm afraid that some of our practices of, I go to church, I follow God, aren't enough to lead us through this season. It's a wake-up call for some of us to say it's not enough to just try to address a superficial surface problem. God wants to go deeper. God wants to give us fresh vision. God wants to give us renewed perspective. God wants to help us to see that in the midst of the fog, he's still at work. And the things around us don't have to change, but what's inside of us, God can transform and he can make us into his image and he can do a good thing. By entering in and following his ways of the, the incarnation. And, and I just want to break that down. What could that look like for your life? What would that look like in my life if we chose to follow Jesus like that? Number one, it would be in presence. In, in our presence. In, in being fully present right here, right now. Now, wherever you are, not saying, well, I got to get out of here, or once this changes, then I'll follow, or, 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 say, no, no, right here, right now, being fully present in your home, in your neighborhood, at work, being fully present, not distracted. I believe this, God has you right where you are for this time, for this moment, and for his purposes. The question is, do you see it? Do you see him at work around you? Are you willing to pray and, and lean in and, and seek him and, 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 and understand this? Your life is your message. I don't mean just your words. I mean your attitude, your actions, the, the posture of your heart, whether it's one of pride or humility, your life is a message. The question is, what kind of a message is your presence sending to others? I, I remember friends a couple of years ago going through an incredibly difficult cancer journey. Showing up at the hospital where they were the ones who were supposed to receive care. And it turned out because of this ministry of having presence. When they would show up, they were fully present. And they became the ones who were caring for the nurses and the doctors and the hospital staff. Because they realized that was their mission field. Fully present. Fully alive to God. I, I remember growing up. I, this Early this morning I was reminded about this 
old, old hymn we used to sing in my small Southern Baptist church in North Carolina. Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. That Emmanuel, God with us, makes a difference how we're then with others. Be fully present. Second, proximity. We, we must make ourselves available to relationship. This means we make time for others, whether that's a, a neighbor out in, in front, or whether that's somebody at work that usually we're just rushing around. We gotta slow down and make ourselves available. Live in relationship. The, the chances are in your life right now, you're not too far from somebody Maybe facing a health crisis, maybe a relationship in crisis, maybe financially it's uncertain, maybe they're so afraid of all the uncertainty, the fog is closing in. What does it mean for you to slow down and be available? I was talking to another friend just a couple of weeks ago, and, and he told me, I've lived beside some of these people for a long time, but it's taken the COVID crisis for all of us to slow down enough for me to actually get to know my neighbors and to be with them and hear their stories, know how to pray for each other. Proximity, being close, being available, but, but here's what I know and here's what I feel and, and here's what, let me just say this, I experience tangibly, maybe worse than some of you because I am an introvert. I know that's hard for you to believe, but because I'm so introverted, these kinds of seasons, these kinds of crisis can cause us to push more towards isolation more away from others than ever before, when what our world needs is for us to be available as never before. Now listen, I'm not saying take off your mask, be crazy. I'm saying get creative. But know that this matters. Know that this matters. Proximity is a gift you can give to others. That's why, as we're going to be talking, you're going to get sick of tire and tired of hearing us say this around here. We're going to not just be asking, hey, where do you go to church? Do you go to church regularly? We're going to be asking this question. Who are you growing in community with on a regular basis? Because you have chosen that as a path of life. Third, powerlessness. We must be servants. We've got to be servants marked by humility, marked by sacrifice, marked by service. If we're going to be the kind of people who demand our rights and, and only look for what's in it for us and have a posture of pride in our lives, we will miss the God moment at hand. Jesus came in powerlessness, humility, sacrificially, to be a servant for others. And we are called to be living sacrifices. That means for some of us, it's time to get out of your comfort zone. For some of us, it's time to quit playing it safe. Again, I'm not talking COVID crisis, pandemic stuff. I'm talking relationally. Number four, proclamation. This means that our opening our lives and by doing that, we're faithfully communicating the story of Jesus in our lives and with our words. Proclamation means our lives give evidence that the words that we say are true and real. We're not just making statements. We're not just spouting opinions. We're not just tweeting or Facebooking. Well, I think... We're proclaiming good news. Jesus has come. Emmanuel is here. God is with us. And guess what? Jesus is coming again. And so our proclamation is not our opinions. It's the gospel good news that in the midst of a fog that all of us may feel, there's still hope. There's still good news. The gospel message is Jesus comes to rescue sinners. Jesus comes to give hope to those who are hopeless. Jesus comes to give peace to those whose lives are in crisis. Jesus comes to fill our hearts with love so we can love others in that same way. And we're to follow in his ways. And we're not to let the fog cause us to lose sight of his goodness and his grace and his purpose. 
That's why our vision as a church even is simply this, to see, did you get that? To see God's hope transform our cities one story at a time. We want to see this. We want to hear this. We want to experience it. We don't want us to just say, well, I know this person and they experience transformation. No, no. We want to see it. We want to experience ourselves. We want those that we love and care about that we're around to experience his transformation for themselves as well. 1952 Two months after Florence Chadwick's failed attempt to swim from Catalina to California coastline, she tried again. Nothing had really changed. Same cold day, same chilly waters, and would you believe it, again the fog settled around. However, this time, things were different. This time, she said, I had a mental image of the shoreline in mind every hour that I swam. And I kept going and I kept going because that image gave me hope. For the Christian, heaven is that distant shoreline brought near by Jesus. And our focus isn't just on some destination out in the future that we hope we can get there. Our focus is this. In Jesus, here comes heaven. Emmanuel, God with us. He's come to save his people from their sins. And as we saturate our minds with his word and we pray our vision is renewed we begin to see a little bit clearer as we sing songs of the season like we did joy to the world the lord has come we're reminded that that jesus is the one that breaks through the fog jesus is the one that, that gives our eyes this ability to see And so as we sing, our vision is renewed. Maybe for some of us, in order for our vision to be renewed, we also have to turn off the TV, put down the phone, get off social media, because that distraction is more than we can handle in this season. But he wants, God wants to remind us, this is how much he cares in the midst of the fog, the turmoil, the pain, the uncertainty. God didn't say, here's what you need to do. God said, here's what I'll do. I'm coming for you. Not like Terminator, I'm coming for you. I'm I'm coming for you because I love you. I'm coming to be near, to make myself available, to serve you, and to proclaim to you the good news. The kingdom of heaven is near. Do you see it? We pray with me. God, will you help us to hear your voice? Will you help us to trust that you are near? Maybe there's someone listening to my words and even my prayer today that they've never, they've never turned to you. They've never given their life to you. They've never, as Jesus said, repented and believed the good news. I pray that today would be the day of salvation, that they would turn to you, that they would say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I believe in you. Forgive me of my sins. Others of us, we need a fresh vision. We need to be reminded of these glimpses of grace, the hope of heaven, Emmanuel, God, is here, and his name is Jesus. Thank you for your love. Help us in the middle of the fog, help us in the middle of the confusion, help us in the middle of the uncertainty to not lose sight of you. Renew our vision. Help us to trust you that we could then go and live for you and represent others so others could see you, Jesus, in us.
your name we pray.